Okay, cool. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is week 18 of the ENM 2020 course. Um, we've got our, our uh, weekly question and answer session, and we have uh, Mona Papage, Corey Merrow, and Marlon Kobos, as well as me here. Uh, we're going to jump right in with Corey because he's on a, a limited time uh, frame and can only be with us for a little while. So I'm going to jump right to the questions um, and let Corey answer the questions that he found most interesting. So go for it, Corey. Sure. Let's start with uh, 2212. I'll read that. Um, I see that the choice of the domain um, or background can seriously affect my results. Is there a way I can test the effectiveness of my choice? Um, and so let's, let's split that out into, um, there's both the selection of the domain or the region that you want to model over, and then there's the sampling of the background points within that region. Um, and so uh, the background points part of it is pretty uh, straightforward thanks to point process models. So I'll maybe address that first as the, as the easier thing to address. Um, the idea is that you want to um, characterize the entire landscape that you're that you're looking at, and so um, a number of people asked different variants of this question: how many background points, or how do I select the background points? And basically, the rule for this, with respect to integration, is to select them um, such that your likelihood function or your gain function converges to some particular value. So a lot of people use ten thousand background points randomly sampled because that was something that um, was done in the um, Phillips version of MaxN. Um, it doesn't hurt to do more. It really never hurts to do more samples of uh, a background. It just takes longer to compute. And so um, if you are worried about whether more samples are relevant, you can look at how you can rerun the model multiple times and just say, how does the, um, the gain function or the regularized gain function that comes out of MaxN or the um, likelihood if you're not doing a um, regularized model, how that um, changes as a function of the background size. And what you should see is sort of an asymptote. And once you see that you've hit the asymptote, you've got an adequate number of background points. So that's something that, and, and there's um, an example of this, maybe somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's in the Renner and Wharton 2013 paper that um, describes the equivalence between MaxN and point process models. I think they show that, how to, that the reason for doing that asymptote. Um, anyway, so that's the, the, the um, easy part in, the, in a relative sense. Uh, the harder part is how should you choose your domain? And so I think largely um, people do that based on uh, some area that they have an interest in if they've got some sort of an applied thing. So they might just choose a subset of a region because that's the only place that they need to make a model for because they're interested in you know, um, state level conservation or something like that. Um, I think it's probably a good idea to choose a domain that includes, um, I don't know, there's so many different applications. Uh, I don't know if other people want to, to join in. You know, if, if, you're, if you're looking at fine scale variation, you don't want to have a very broad domain because then you'll kind of get the big picture and you won't zoom in to the finer scale detail that you might care about at a, you know, the a political level unit. If you're looking at broad biogeographic scales, it tends not to hurt to have a particularly large domain because that tends to just tie down the edges of, of your model at the edge. Um, but it, it's pretty context specific. So I don't know, do you guys have any general rules that you like to, usually I just hand wave that this is a reasonable thing to do and then people accept it, you know? So I guess I, I would make a distinction between a distribution model and a niche model. And you know, if I'm doing some transfer of my model that would require that I'm getting a comprehensive uh, picture of the, the fundamental niche of the species, then I wanna go essentially at the level of the full distribution of the species, or maybe even some higher clade, you know, a sister species pair or a genus, um, 
because I'm really setting out to characterize the full limits of you know, the abiotic niche. If I'm doing a distribution model, like you said, you know, if I'm interested in you know, the, the distribution of barn owls in the state of Kansas, uh, I know that barn owls go much farther in every direction, but I'm looking to characterize the details here. And so then, as you say, if I do a global model of barn owl distributions, I'm not going to get any detail within Kansas. Uh, so that, that's kind of one level of answer. And then this, the, the other level is I would equate, when you're doing those broader biogeographic scales, I would equate it with the, the, um, the accessible area, essentially the, the area that the species has explored. And then you can either make explicit assumptions about dispersal distances or something like that, or um, we've we've had one talk in the in uh, the course about uh, an explicit simulation based method for establishing that area. So um, I think I mean those would be the important concepts from from my standpoint. Mona, Marlon, any thoughts? I, I, I like to, to experiment with the number of backgrounds based, background points based on the um, size of occurrence data set. So to try to have similar prevalence of presences if I, if I try, if I have multiple species that I'm that I'm running. Um, it's, yeah, but it's so hard. <laughs> choosing, choosing the extent of the area requires knowledge of, of dispersal and then the number of backgrounds. When, when do you stop? Do you want to inflate your AUC? <laughs> Increase the number of backgrounds, so on and so forth. Uh, I like your, your um, Corey, uh, the um, suggestion of, of experimenting with the number of backgrounds until you get some sort of stable uh, modeling. Um, and I was going to ask if, if um, there's, like, if you are using some R implementation for that or um, how do you get Yeah, what, what I did a while back was uh, I did it with um, MaxNet and um, I just, so I was doing it in particular for the BN range models, the, the um, plant models that we use. And I think I grabbed about 500 random species and I just basically um, sampled the background 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 points for global distributions. Uh, or not that I was projecting globally, but the plants might be anywhere on the globe. Um, yeah. And I was choosing a background based in that case, I think it was on like a thousand kilometer buffer around any presence points. Mm -hmm. And so basically I just um, said, when do we seem to see convergence? And I didn't do any statistical estimation. I just kind of squinted at all 500 of them. Um, and, uh, you know, broadly, it actually looked like about 40,000 um, background points seem to consistently safely, you know, um, give you a good estimate. Now, I can't say, you know, and that would be looking at the value of the, re of the regularized gain as a function yeah. of number of background points. 40,000 was safe. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the coefficients of the model are changing in any meaningful way. It just, you know, the gain's going up a little bit, but you know, you might have some modal response curve. So I didn't, I didn't check that. Basically what I said is 40,000 is what I wish I had. And then I ran it on my computer at the time and said, oh, that's too slow. I'm, I'm trying to do this for like a hundred thousand species. I'm not doing that. <laughs> and so I made it 20,000, uh, because it's more than 10,000 and it, um, didn't, uh, it hasn't, you know, produced any wildly different results. And so it's, you know, um, I would say it's uh, an educated guest uh, yeah. is, is basically, mm -hmm. but, but that process of, act, you know, if you're doing this and this is partly the reason that I have these hacks is because I'm trying to do it for 50,000 species or hundred thousand species at a time and not babysitting it. If I'm doing this for one species, I'm actually going to do that simulation and look at the gain and, and um, yeah. check for that. So I did that with MaxNet. Yeah. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about, um, you know, the Hutchinsonian dream versus Wallacean dream. Um, and there were, there were questions about, like, do I need to think about 
what what uh, situation I'm in for each species or and yeah when you have yeah it's like when you have hundreds thousands yeah. <laughs> or more species how do you it's really hard to each one to um optimize various aspects not just background for each species so it becomes yeah it becomes really difficult yeah, yeah. that's what i've spent the last three years doing for the bn range modeling workflow is, is trying to like automate that decision making process you know put us all out of a job and, yeah. and you know, automate the, the range modeling um and uh so what i actually do for background or uh, for for domain selection there is i use uh eco regions from dinnerstein yeah. 2017 and if i want to get uh precision you know and the idea is any any and so this was after initially doing 500 or 1000 kilometer buffers around the presence locations and what i found is that i ended up getting all these you know when you stack up the maps i got all these like semicircle you know things uh that when you stack them up on a map it looks like kind of a coffee stain you know on your diversity <laughs> map and i said okay well you know it's an artifact i can live with an artifact but i would really prefer if my artifact were biological rather than um rather than based on a decision that i made and so i said well mm -hmm. if i'm going to have boundaries i'd rather have them be eco region boundaries because at least somebody has thought about whether that eco region boundary makes sense and they might be imperfect but they're at least biological yeah. and so mm -hmm. when i want to get in on the um the specifics of variation within an eco region i just use the eco region itself as the domain and then when i want to get at more broader biogeographic scales i use any eco regions that are neighbors to that the eco regions where the species occurs and that's what i use for my um yeah. domain and so it's it seems pretty safe you know it's an assumption but it's a, it's a biologically based one so, so just to point out kind of a more general lesson for some of our our participants who are maybe just getting started notice that for a lot of these these crucial decisions there aren't right and wrong answers <clears throat> the only thing that is right or wrong is being explicit about what you did somebody should be able to go back to you know your data and your study and replicate it step by step assumption by assumption so it's wrong if you make assumptions and don't make them explicit. But in many cases, these decisions about, you know, what do I use for my background or my domain? What do I do for this? How many points? There isn't a right answer. There are just opinions, feelings, uh, tendencies. You know, 40,000 points is gonna, is gonna take until uh, the next millennium for, for Corey's models to run. So he says, well, 20,000 because it's more than 10,000. And, you know, the important thing about that is it's explicit. That's what matters. Yeah. So I don't want anybody complaining when I write a 40 page paper on the methods of the BN range models because that's what it's going to take to explain all these. So um, what, one note that I wanted to mention that, that Mona brought up, which is a good point, is when I say I'm going to use 20 or 40,000 background points, that's for model fitting, but that's not what I would use for model evaluation because uh, if I'm going to do AUC on those guys, that's going to inflate my AUC because I'm going to get all the background points right because I, you know, modeling barn owls with, you know, background points from Alaska. Um, so for that reason, it's, it's careful to choose those background points more judiciously because AUC is designed for presence absence and we just don't have absence. And so, again, you just have to make some assumptions about what reasonable background points um, there are to compare. So I would choose a much smaller set based probably on the prevalence like you men mentioned. Yeah. Um, so should we go to, the, um, maybe I should do a couple like little quick questions to make sure that I deal with them. And then I have, think I have one more that I think is a group discussion question. Okay. Um, Let's see, uh, 2215, um, will the output of a model be different depending on if we run it in max event jar or max net? And the reason that I chose to answer this question is because some person is gonna try to be diligent and compare those models, they're gonna get different answers and they're gonna spend an inordinate amount of time trying to figure out why. And it's just that they're, they're using different optimization algorithms in the background Broadly and conceptually, they should get the same answers uh, in terms of if you squint at the response curves, they should probably look pretty similar between them. 
but they're not going to have the same numeric values. So if you find a qualitatively different map or qualitatively different response curve, um, that would be troubling and something that you probably want to dig into a little bit. But by and large, that um, seems to me like it shouldn't happen. It's just, you know, it's a different way to follow through your optimization routine. But don't worry if the numbers don't match up. Worry if the general broad scale patterns match up. Um, so hopefully I just got some researcher at least like a day or two of their life back with that, um, with that answer. Because I know that I did that. Actually, I did that with a, for my max like versus max ent paper. I was wondering why different ways of estimating things were not coming out the same. Um, on line 2219, um, where can we find R code for weighted GLMs, including sampling offsets? Again, this hopefully will save you some time. Um, the place that I uh, first saw it demonstrated was in the appendices of the Renner et al. Um, 2015 point process modeling review in Trends in Ecology and Evolution. So they give you a couple different ways to do it. Um, they actually give you like seven ways to fit it, but there's two easy ways with GLMs, um, either a weighted Poisson or a weighted binomial regression. Um, and then if you wanted to see a whole workflow of how to do that, and I think somebody later on asked for doing that in the particular context of a sampling bias model, um, my GEB paper in 2016 has appendices which should be open access, and that gives you a full R-based workflow. And... I definitely think I'm pretty sure that it includes MaxNet in that one. It may include a scripted version of uh, the MaxNet jar scripting. Um, either is either is perfectly fine way to do it. Um, there are also some appendices for the 2017 GEB paper um, that's more specific to expert maps, but all the and the math is all the same. It's just whether how you want to interpret your offset. So those should be two decent resources that have a lot of fully worked code. Um, Let's see what else. I'm going to come back to the sampling bias question on 2020. Um, okay, so 2229, line 2229, is MinxN part of MaxNet software or is it standalone? Uh, so kind of both. Uh, the minimum cross entropy thing uh, is something that I wrote a paper about, and you can um, hijack uh, the maxent.jar software to fit that by um, doing it through a bias file. So if you have some sort of an offset that you want to put in there, that offset, if it's a spatially continuous thing, is equivalent to the bias file that you can supply to, to maxent.jar. Um, and so whether you want to factor it back out, um, you may be internally maxent factors that back out, the maxent.jar file factors that back out for you. If it's something that you wanted to keep in there, like an expert map, you have to factor it back in, which is basically just multiply the prediction that it gives you by your, um, by your offset. Um, but I think that's, that's a little bit of a hack. So unless you explicitly need features that are in the maxent.jar software, um, I would probably just do it with, with GLM or GLMnet. I think that's a, an easier and more explicit way to do things because then you're controlling what's getting multiplied by what. And the, um, the two, uh, sets of R code that I mentioned for the last question, give you demos on how to do that. Um, uh, 2251, what to do after choosing a regularization multiplier? Should I run the function again? Um, so in the case where you're doing the cross-validation, the internal thing in, in cb.glmnet, that I like to use. Um, yeah, the paradigm is you do the cross validation with your tenfolds. You're gonna find that optimal value. Remember we were plotting like binomial deviance as a function of regularization multiplier. And uh, that's gonna hopefully have some minimum and you select something that's one standard deviation beyond that. Um, so you find that value and then you rerun the model with the full set of data. Um, with that value of the regularization multiplier, and that's what you take as your answer. So it, it's um, maybe it's like a little bit counterintuitive because you're kind of building two different models, but um, it's that's the paradigm that machine learning people seem to be happy with. And so um, I trust their discretion, I guess you could say. Um, is there something else down the bottom here? <laughs> 
Um, okay, let's let's do the the one that I thought we should discuss, which is on sampling bias, um, and that's on line twenty two twenty. And so um, the question is, do you agree with Forcad et al. twenty fourteen that removing samples within a grid of a defined cell size um, and randomly sampling one occurrence per grid cell provides a quick and efficient way to remove bias um, that is likely to be relevant most of the time. So the idea is if you've got um, sampling bias on your data set, uh, if you apply some sort of a coarse grid over the top of that and just sample one cell from each of those, or sorry, one presence from each of those cells, will that remove um, sampling bias? And um, I guess I would say um, definitely maybe. Um, you know, it's a trade-off because a lot of times when people have point models or point data, they don't want to model at very coarse resolution. And in order to do that in a way that is safe, you have to go to coarser resolution. And so I think it's no problem to do that. But then um, you end up um, losing the precision which would, with which you can describe your environment because maybe you go from, maybe you use 100 kilometer grid cells if you have really bad sampling bias. Um, most people want to know um, their species distribution at finer grain than 100 kilometer grid cells. And then secondarily, as you go to that coarser grain, you're going to lose sample size. So that really limits the, the types of models that you can build, you know, whether you should even be considering a machine learning model at all. Um, I would guess that probably you know, if you were looking at 100 kilometer grain size, uh, the number of species that exist globally with sufficient data to build a machine learning model in a meaningful way are probably basically all the species that you don't need to build a model for because we all know exactly where they are because they're common. And so, um, you know, so I guess it's it's a trick about how coarse do you need to build that that grid in order to um, mitigate effects of sampling bias. So if you, you know, um, it's a trade-off. There's no, there's no magic scale. You know, if you were able to do it at 10 kilometer distribution, uh, 10 kilometer resolution, to coarsen out any sampling bias, and you got enough samples to to build a model with that, probably a lot of people would be happy with that. But you know, um, maybe not somebody looking for reserve design because you know, um, a 10 kilometer cell is going to probably include your entire park, so it's not particularly useful. Um, so I don't know, I thought we should maybe discuss like what our favorite or least favorite ways for dealing with sampling bias are because it's, um, I, I, I tend, I don't know if it's a common opinion, I tend to think that after your presence data, it is the most important possible thing that can influence um, the prediction that you get. And, um, and yet still we don't really have, I think in presence only modeling a um, comprehensive way of doing it. There's like six or seven papers out there, all of which have good ideas. And nobody's really synthesized that into like how to test for one or the other. I've thought about writing a paper about it. I just haven't gotten around to doing the testing myself so that I'm confident in the, um, in the answer. So I don't know. What do you guys think? I guess I'd, I'd have a couple of comments. One is that when you see a lot of points here and very few points here, there are a bunch of reasons why that can happen. The obvious one is maybe these are errors and these are the, this is the real distribution. But let's imagine we've cleaned our data. If the reason for the big concentration of, of points is that there are lots of observers there or it's a biological station or it's a developed country versus a underdeveloped country, whatever, then I agree with reducing the, the density of those points. In some cases, uh, you don't want to you don't want to subsample or downsample those those overly dense places. I work a lot with uh, modeling disease occurrences, and sometimes the reason why you have a lot of points in a place and fewer in another place is that the disease is more frequent. And so in that case, you know, again, given the sampling process that led to the array of points that you have, you may or may not want to downsample. That's comment number one. Comment number two is that um, I personally would shy away from the Forcad, you know, kind of uh, grid-based approach because 
in my view at least, a lot of the oversampling that does exist is a function of political boundaries, human cultural attributes. You know, is this a society with a, for example, a bird watching uh, culture or not? So, you know, you see the US Mexico border, you'll see densities of any cross border species you'll see the densities go down tenfold between, let's say, you know, Southern Texas or Southeast Arizona and Northern Mexico. Um, or it may be around cities, it may be you know, countries that participate in, in GBIF versus countries that don't, you know, 101 re reasons. And so, you know, and this is something that we always debate and I always take a lot of criticism for, even in from my own lab group, um, I frequently will argue that at least amongst our options should be a by-hand identification of oversampled regions. Again, you know, thinking politically, thinking all these non-geographic and not very spatial things and you know, essentially identifying these cult clusters and then downsampling those to some reference density. And it's subjective, it's worrisome, I don't like it either, but the, the spatial processes that lead to some of the oversampling that we do are so weird that oftentimes a bias surface or a grid-based or a distance-based downsampling just doesn't get it. That's, that's my, you know, kind of empirical world view of how to deal with these things. My uh, simplified approach uh, least more recently has been to, um, and I know this is going to go into possibly extrapolation, but has been to, um, to use the checkerboard approach to try to break the space, the possible sampling bias. But yeah, if it is, if the training and testing um, boxes, or I don't know how to call them, uh, are quite different, then, then I run into the issue of, of actually without wanting, I'm extrapolating the model. Um, but if the, if the, my hope is that, <laughs> I, haven't <laughs> I haven't tested that, my hope is that if the checkerboard is dense enough if I don't have like four <laughs> four quadrats that I'm I'm applying on the occurrence data if I had many then then the um, the potential for extrapolation is lower because I'm breaking the spatial you know maybe a I don't know a bird uh, sampling transect I'm, I'm breaking that spatial pattern but I'm not hopefully creating extrapolation uh, if my blocks are not too huge. One other comment is that uh, I, I really like the, the idea of, of bias files conceptually, um, but I have run into some situations where they seem to simply not work because of the massive scale differences of the bias. So a few years ago, we did a study of a uh, an invasive dove in North America, which came from Eurasia. And so I'm not going to remember the exact numbers, but let's say we had 90,000 points from Eurasia. And 95, 97% of those points came from Western Europe. Wow. And so in attempting to develop a native range model, that even approximated the distribution of the species across Eurasia, we were having to deal with this massive imbalance where you know, one-tenth of the native distribution produced 90-something percent of the points. And so it seemed like an ideal one for bias files where we took the density of points of um, of reports of other birds that were relatively similar to this one, you know, kind of terrestrial birds that that would be 
sampled in a similar way. We used that to create a bias file. But essentially there you had the same massive bias. And so it essentially meant that Eastern Europe to East Asia contributed almost no points to the background because the density of reporting was so massive in Western Europe. Um, and so we tried you know, log transformations of the bias surface. And that made a bit more of, a, uh, of an improvement. Um, but it was, it, it was to the point where the best method ended up being by hand, you know, just delineating your, your oversampled areas by what you know of politics and participation and reporting and things like that. But no, the checkerboard approach is, is quite good, especially if your patterns are fairly broad uh, in scale rather than fine and focal. Yeah, I use the, uh, oh, go ahead, Mona. Go ahead, go ahead. I just say I use the checkerboard. It's a modification of it, but I use that approach too, just to, so that way I don't have to toss out points, but I at least when I'm fitting, any aggregation occurs within a clump. Um, but what I do, because I, you know, you have to choose the scale of that checkerboard based on your spatial pattern. And, you know, I'm typically doing that for like lots of species where that is difficult. So what I do is um, a cluster analysis on the coordinates of the points. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't choose any particular scale. And then what I do is, um, if I have enough records, I break that into 25 clusters. And then I randomly assign those to five different folds. And so I try, that way I try to avoid the clumping, like if you have those four quadrats, like you were mentioning, that leads to extrapolation, that tries to minimize the extrapolation. Um, can't avoid it. You know, there's going to be some edge ones, but it minimizes it, and then it makes it so that I don't ever have to think about what the scale is. Um, the trade-off is that you can have very imbalanced sizes of the folds because you had one outlying point over here, and you can have 27 points over here, and um, you know, so it's a trade-off. It's not perfect, but um, I've found that that um, behaves reasonable for um at least in the case where you're not going to build a single species model and look at it you know um in in great detail through different methods so but in general i think that's you know and actually i think it's it's good to do a little bit of both you might do a little bit of thinning i mean it's never a bad idea to do this checkerboard thing you, you know it may not help but i don't think it can ever hurt anything um i think it's i think it's pretty safe to always do it um and so you you can combine those two too you know i i tend to use um uh, SP thin, to, so that way, uh, rather than the grid-based approach that Forcad mentions, it's just a little bit more flexible because it just says randomly subsample points that are within X kilometers of one another. Um, and so, I don't know, that's probably just because I'm like friends with the guy who made it, um, you know, probably more than anything else. But um, but I think that's a perfectly good approach. And then, it, you know, it, um, it saves any quirks from having grid cell boundaries where two things are right next to one another on opposite sides of a boundary. So I use that in conjunction with the basically the the um, cell based fold um, description. What I what I like to consider when I'm doing this kind of thinning is uh, the uh, how how heterogeneous environments can be considering the variables I'm using. So mm -hmm. I am always facing this trouble in my country, and in South America, close to the Andes, especially all the coastal regions are generally homogeneous in terms of environment almost all the time, like considering especially climate uh, uh, variables. So I, I tend to do like uh, different uh, distances in different uh, levels of heterogeneity considering the environment. So uh, largely, largely homogeneous uh, regions, I tend to do like, let's say 10 kilometers, but close to the Andes, uh, do a 10 kilometer thinning, it's, it's like, it's not good. It's gonna, it's gonna make you lose a lot of information because every kilometer represents a different value in the mountains. And I think that's, that's like following the idea of a special autocorrelation. Like it's safer to do something like that. I think, I think that's a really good point and that we should, does anybody, so because these models are only fit in environmental space, none of us are doing spatially explicit models. It actually only matters where the bias sits in environmental space. So we should, if we're going to do this grid based approach from Forcad, it should be a grid on your environmental variables, not on graphic space. 
necessarily. Um, does anybody do that? I mean, it seems like it's worth considering. But see, that, that's the weird part because a niche is a bias in environmental space, right? right? A niche yeah. is, I like these conditions and I don't like those conditions. And so, I mean, I, I've, I've had that discussion 10 times and I've never come around to being comfortable with how you could distinguish the niche bias from the sampling bias. I mean, I guess you could, you know, as usual, look at a reference group and see what its biases are and then look for extra amount of bias and consider that the niche. Right. I think, yeah. I think uh, like doing something like what you suggested is something like people usually call uh, thinning in the environmental space. And it's, it's kind of dangerous. I mean, thinking about how different distances can work in the geography and helping you like uh, take some of the, the points that are like farther from each other. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that you, your niche is gonna be unbiased in terms of what's better for the species. So still if you have like thin the records in the geographic space, you may encounter that some of the environments that they explore are more common and then those are going to be considered the most suitable or stuff like that. But if you think special, uh, specifically or explicitly in the environmental space, you're gonna kind of lose that um, idea of what is what is more commonly used by the species. At least that, that's what my feeling is. I haven't, I haven't done it explicitly. And I think it's easy. I mean, I have, I have done environmental thinning, but for other purposes. And, and what you end up is with like points that are over like uniformly dispersed in the environmental conditions that you are uh, trying to uh, consider. But again, I haven't done that for models, it's for other purposes. I think, I think it depends on your use case because if you wanna get at habitat um, suitability or variation in use, then doing that environmental thinning like town mentioned will you'll lose that um signal but if you just want to do occurrence does it occur here um you know i guess um ultimately you're going to threshold a model later on so that variation and suitability is kind of washed out um i think it might be okay i was i was thinking about it from the you know ultimately what somebody wants is a binary map um that says is it here or isn't it here and in that case you you can you know, toss differences in habitat suitability. So, I don't know. I mean, I guess I guess the fact that we're discussing all these different ways means that we should probably write a paper about uh, the different, <laughs> comparing the pros and cons of different ones, right? So. Yeah. Um, and, and again, it, it comes back around. And if you look at the 2,200 questions that have been, that have been posed during this course, a lot of them are, what's the right way to do this? What's the right way to do that? And, we, you know, here again, everybody's seeing that you have, you know, three smart people and me, and you can have these discussions where you could build a case for doing it this way. You could build a case for doing it this way. To me, the only, there are only two guiding principles. You think about the concepts. If the concepts say do this and don't do that, Follow that rule. If, the, if your conceptual framework tells you that something's a better idea, don't do the other thing. But if your conceptual basis is, is you know, does not give an opinion about which of these two methods or which of these five methods is better, then probably what you should do is do all of those options. So those are my two operating principles. And my students hate it when I say, Hmm, I don't know. Conceptually, I don't see a difference, so do both of them. <laughs> sure they, they then say, oh, I hate you, Tao. <laughs> well, if, if you knew the answer, it wouldn't be research, right? So. Exactly. 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 It's character. Um, I should duck out to go back to my other call that was expecting me 15, 20 minutes ago. Um, <laughs> But uh, that's okay. fun for you. I, you got to admit it. Yeah, no, I like talking to you guys. Uh, it's definitely good to um, brainstorm on some of this stuff. I like, I like the questions the most that I don't have a good answer to uh, yeah. when I was reading through these. So that's uh, it's cool that people are asking those kind of questions. Well, thanks for joining us, Corey. <laughs>
All right. Good to talk to all you. Stay safe. Bye. Bye. Okay. Mona and Marlon, do you guys have questions that you'd like to look at? I, I was going to um, add one thing to the heterogeneity, environmental heterogeneity question, one, one viewpoint, uh -huh. uh, which is if, if there is sampling bias in spatial sampling bias, my assumption is that because the locations in geograph geographically locations are close and, and in the situation of using one kilometer resolution climate data that we know actually is interpolated from meteorological stations. So one kilometer a pixel are not, uh, the pixels are not really characterizing the climate at that one kilometer. So given that we are working with coarse climate data and we have sampling bias in ge geography, my interpretation of heterogeneity, environmental heterogeneity and trying to sample, trying to subsample your occurrence data in environmental heterogeneity is that what you are trying to do is represent a certain set of combination of conditions uh, one time or not, not over represent a certain, a certain set of environmental conditions. So I've, I've recently, like for the lab, for working with a graduate student uh, recently, I suggested that she does an environmental heterogeneity subsampling of her occurrence data in the attempt to link the spatial bias with the heterogeneity bias that we have because we are you know sampling the same or close pixels mm -hmm. environmentally and geographically close and if you're not in the andes you know if you're not in ecuador um yeah there should be less um heterogeneity close by anyways <laughs> that was my we're we're in the great plains and you're at the foot of the appalachians and a couple kilometers in Tennessee, uh, especially in Eastern Tennessee, makes a lot more difference than it does in Kansas. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But we can go to another question. <laughs> well, let, let's, this is, I, I picked out a couple that might be interesting for us to talk about. Um, with few occurrences to make a model, it could be a good idea to use just two feature classes, linear and quadratic. Or is, are there times when an over-parameterized model is a good one? So that's an interesting question. Um, I guess to start off with, there are also under-parameterized models. And so the, the real question is, what is the level of complexity that is required by the particular species, the particular landscape, and the particular environmental space to explain its patterns of presence and absence. Now using just those two feature classes, and maybe product as well, has one big advantage, which is that it, they tend to produce um, objects in environmental space, essentially niche estimates that look more like a fundamental niche should look, which is to say convex. And so in that sense, I like that much more than the idea of threshold and hinge values and things like that, classes. Um, so that, that's kind of one set of points, which is that linear and quadratic and the, the simpler feature types get us closer to something that looks like a fundamental niche. Um, but if you have a fairly multidimensional niche, or if you have a, um, a complex existing niche, and that's what you're setting out to, uh, to estimate, then you definitely run a risk of under-parameterizing your model. And so you can imagine going across a whole spectrum from few to many environmental dimensions, 
from simple to complex feature classes, and in Maxent from low from high to low values of regularization. And at least in those three dimensions, you are going from an you're going across a spectrum of underparameterization to the right amount of parameterization to overparameterization. And the only problem is we don't have great ways of figuring out where the right amount is. Now, my approach to that, and we'll talk about this in model evaluation, is evaluating with independent uh, occurrence data sets, essentially letting the, the data vote for the right model. But anyhow, I just thought this would be a, a good question to throw out and, and chew on a bit amongst the the three of us. It is a good question. It depends also on how many variables are you using. Uh, it's it's hard. Even like in and with Maxent, it becomes a little bit uh, more problematic because you can have models selected during the process of model calibration that we we're going to see later. <coughs> that tells you that. Uh, Species with few occurrences can be modeled, their, we can model their niches with uh, very complex feature classes. But at the end, you go and see in the lambdas file, which is the one that actually tells you what kind of variables were used during the modeling and Maxim used those during the modeling. And you see that uh, maybe not using all the feature classes that you asked the program to do, but only a few of them. And, sometimes not even all the variables you wanted to use. So we need to be careful about that. And, and probably that's something that is not uh, so clear in the algorithms we're using for model calibration, but uh, I think it's important. And <clears throat> the only way to know <laughs> what feature classes are working well is doing, doing the evaluation, doing uh, like testing on different combinations. I think that's, that's important. I think it's useful to remember that a lot of these algorithms that we use are fitting multidimensional envelopes or, or shapes around points. And if you give them free reign of complexity, you don't punish them for complexity, they can very easily just fit some sort of model that identifies every training point uniquely. And that's probably not a very predictive model. So I, if I remember way back, I mean, it might have been Jorge Lobo did a thing where he put in occurrence points and spelled out, I don't know if it was his name or, or love or something like that. And what he found was that using a, a complex enough environmental space, he could produce a distribution model that spelled his name. Okay. And so it's a reminder to us that, that we're seeking general properties of the distributions of species with respect to environmental parameters. And so what we really need to do is get the model complex enough to be able to essentially respond to the challenges, but not so complex that we fit to the distribution of the species and the distribution of the sampling. And so um, again, to me, it comes back to the ideal situation is I have an independent set of occurrence data collected with different methods and under different biases. And a good model will be able to predict that independent data set. Okay, because that's saying that we're getting at some general property of the, the distribution of the species in environmental space or in geographic space but some general property. And I, I think the, uh, 
KU ENM package is, is aiming to do that to, I've never used it, but <laughs> based on the, the presentations that I, I saw from, from Marlon and you, um, it's attempting to, to take into account comple model complexity and not, not select a model that, has, that is complex um, to the point of no generalization. Or? Yeah, I mean, KUENM first of all asks comparing with some other, hopefully completely independent data set, are the predictions better than random predictions? Yes or no? Second, <laughs> for that other data set, what is the omission rate? Is to say, how much does my, uh, my model miss as far as pr proportion of those independent points? And then third, imagine we have some set of models that pass the first two tests. Third, we say, simple models preferred over complex models. But they are the simple models that pass the test of statistical mm -hmm. significance and pass the test of sufficient predictive performance. Yeah. I have another meeting in three minutes. So if you don't mind, I was gonna I was gonna ask if we can address the question question twenty two oh seven, which you highlighted down. Okay. Um, because yes, I do that. <laughs> so it's good to know how wrong I am. But I've I've done this where I run a preliminary model. And then I select the variables that contribute 95% and run again the model. And unless they are highly correlated, the, the, the variables that are in that 95% um, or 90% or some, some arbitrary <laughs> cut of cumulative contribution. So I don't know. What, what do you think about that, about this I question? I think it's defendable. Um, my only worry is, you know, 95% means that we have some, some variables that might be not generating the major pattern, but tweaking it and refining it. And, you know, so I think sometimes the devil is in the details. Or sometimes the things that we're most interested in are the details and not the broad patterns. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it would be interesting to see, you know, if you say um, 95% or 99% or 99.9%, how much do those models each differ, you know, as you leave out the, the lower contributing mm -hmm. variables, how much of a difference does that make? And especially, do my omission rates start to bump up? Yeah. If my omission rates with independent data stay low, I'm right with you. Okay. But if we go from, you know, 2% omission to 7% omission to 10% omission, I start to worry. Because then we may be losing the devil who's in charge of those details. Yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. Okay. Well, we'll stop here for today. Um, Thanks, Mona. Thanks, Marlon. And thanks to Corey, who's already departed us. Uh, but thanks a lot. And we'll see you all next week with more on algorithms.